Good day, Tony. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to allow me to uh, record our conversations and then post them to YouTube later. Um, as a way of an introduction, can you tell us your name and uh, share with us a little bit about your background in L&D? And then uh, the third point would be what it is you would like to accomplish with our conversations going forward. Thank you, Guy. My name is Tony Cortez. I am actually a senior manager for learning and development in a charity in Toronto at the moment. So my journey to L&D started in 2015 when I went back to school to get a certificate in instructing adults from George Brown, you know, George Brown College here in Toronto. I think they're a university now, I'm not quite sure. And after I finished that uh, certificate program, I went on to get a designation at the Institute for Performance and Learning. So I have the certified training practitioner and then the certified training and development professional after I gained a few years of experience in the field. So I am in mainstream L&D guy, but the reason for this uh, call is actually I wanted to learn from experts in the field like yourself, who have been there, done that, if you like. And if I can learn from you, I don't have to go through a longer circuitous route by myself, you know, and this is why, you know, we have programs, mentorship programs, uh, as part of L&D is so that we can learn from our more, our more seasoned, more experienced colleagues in the field who can show us the way and tell us that's probably a pitfall there. And also that's where I'm coming from in this, um, in this sessions, uh, Guy. And thank you very much for accommodating. Oh, you're, you're more than welcome. Um, so a couple of points before I launch into, you know, how I was thinking about a uh, structuring our conversations, uh, multiple conversations, multiple recordings, multiple postings. Um, but, you know, number one is I think that you, uh, me, everyone needs multiple mentors, multiple mm. coaches, multiple people in our network that we can check in with. And so, um, you know, don't take my word for it. You know, this is an N of one. I've had some experiences, but it is an N of one. And so it's important to uh, look beyond a single source always, uh, especially in L&D. Um, and uh, then uh, per my T-shirt here, you know, adopt what you can and adapt to the rest. And within that is also reject things that don't quite fit the mental models that you are building uh, regarding philosophies and processes and practices, uh, you may already have some things in place. And so that, you know, I may have one and you have one and you may need to reject mine um, because you already have something that works. And that's the key to it all is that, you know, it needs to work. It needs to work in your context because mine has been very different. Mm -hmm. um, so as I thought about this and how I might structure uh, our conversations, I kind of see it in in at least three parts. And so I thought, uh, as I as I thought about this, I created some graphics. Um, I don't know that I'll show them today, but basically I thought, well, there's a kind of a macro big picture level. And then there's a mid picture level, you know, the middle tier. And then there's a micro down to the nitty gritty, how things get done. And the nitty gritty of how things get done that might cover, you know, the uh, learning and development uh, intake process, project planning processes, analysis, design, development, uh, pilot testing, implementation, evaluation, those kinds of micro processes and, and such. Um, but I thought where we might start is the mid level. So, an L&D function, a department or you know, a function, something in the hierarchy of an enterprise, uh, private or public, uh, governmental or, or whatever. Um, and how I've looked at that as a framing device to help my clients figure out, you know, where should they focus? Uh, what are the processes of an L&D function? I wrote a book back in 2001 about this. It was called a T and D systems view. So it's kind of a systems thinking systems view of an L and D or training and development function, as we used to call it in the old days. 
Um, and so, you know, learning and development functions are more than just an addy like process or a SAM process or whatever process, you know, you've, you use or have adapted. And so I think it's, it's important to look at it from that kind of a sense. And so I, I, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But so then the next thing I thought going from the mid level would be go go to the micro level. So within all of those processes, you know, which ones do you have uh, questions about? What should we have discussions about? And that'll be your call to decide, you know, where you would like to focus uh, once I've uh, introduced you to my framing device. That framing device came from a project I did with a, with a part of AT&T back in the mid 80s. And I've used it with a couple of other companies since then, but but we were back then talking to my clients' clients about process orientation, and this was a big deal back then. At the you know reengineering the processes and blah blah blah, and so as my client was telling their clients that they needed to become more process oriented, one of them flipped the question back on my client to say, "So what are your processes?" Well, that led to a consulting engagement with me where we framed their processes and how they connected uh, and how they connected inside and outside their own function uh, in order to get their work done. And so, again, that's where we'll start. Then we'll drop down into the micro level uh, where, you know, it could be about instructional development or any of the various uh, processes that I've kind of outlined. Um, and and my book and and what I would hope you would do would be to assess from your experience base, your current situation, previous situations, perhaps about, you know, where are the opportunities for improvement that might have significant returns? You know, my goal was never to get all these processes into some Six Sigma level of perfection where, you know, you only have four screw ups out of a million opportunities to screw up or do well. And so... Um, but once we look at that, we can talk about those individual processes. Then part three, as I see it, um, and there may be several parts to part two, because you may want to do different, you know, focus on a couple of different things and it may take more than one conversation to address those. But part three then is the macro level. So we'll go from uh, mid-level to micro level and then back to macro level. And that's the big picture systems view of how L&D fits within an overall enterprise and within its performance context with all of its various stakeholders. And uh, we can talk a little bit about that. And again, you know, uh, uh, adopt what you can, adapt the rest, reject some, um, get multiple viewpoints from people uh, because I think that's really critical. I'm, I've spent my entire career now, I started in 1979, uh, adopting things and adapting things because once I had adopted some things and I adapted, I, you know, I saw somebody else had something and it was a little bit more than what I had, but I, but I had to change uh, language, the labels that I used. I had to change some of the imagery that I had uh, seen and, and taken into my own set of, uh, I call them philosophies, processes, and practices. Um, and so as each individual that's in this business um, accumulates uh, a lot of uh, expert wisdom, experienced wisdom about what works under what conditions and what doesn't work under what conditions. Um, they build themselves their own set of mental models and tools and techniques for conducting their work. And of course, then when you go to work for somebody, you're going to use theirs, but maybe you can augment theirs with yours. Um, sometimes if you're an, uh, an external consultant, you have to have some way to approach things that's compatible with whoever your client is and whatever processes and language, et cetera, that they use. Um, so that's my idea, the three three parts after the today. Uh, so I was, I was going to give you some reading assignments, mm -hmm. and these are uh, f from books that are for free that I've written in the past and made available as free PDFs to the world. And there's additional books, but they're for sale. So you can do whatever you'd like and we will schedule the next meeting whenever you're ready. But uh, so it gives some structure and some content to you to review. And then 
will address whatever you would like to address rather than me trying to cover the whole thing, uh, boil the ocean for a cup of tea. Um, we can narrow in on those things that are important to you as you see them. So after the reading assignment in between our meetings and recordings, uh, the next one then will be, well, let's talk about what you read and what questions did you have and all of that. And then I will also set up the next part, which will go to the micro level. And I've got another book that's for free and you can uh, read that and or skim it or scan it or however you'd like to focus on the things that are important to you. Um, Cause one size does not fit all. And I've written a lot of stuff that covers, you know, A to Z and you know, that may or may not be, you know, what, what meets your needs. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we'll meet again and we'll debrief on what your readings were and what questions you have, et cetera. And then I'll set up the last part of this and, you know, we'll just take it, you know, those steps and see if we can do things that uh, are a value to you that meet your needs. And I don't want to push things, but, um, but, and I've got a lot of content and videos and articles and presentations and all sorts of things like that, but I don't want to overwhelm you either. Mm -hmm. But if you're hungry enough for some specific things, you know, we, I can tee you up with some additional resources that may help, which then should lead to additional, you know, questions or comments or concerns about any of that. Um, How does that sound to you? Very, very nice, actually. It's very structured, so <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, that's that's kind of me. I'm I, I probably over overkill in the extreme regarding structure and things like that, but I. But I have to have see, you know, where might we go and all that stuff. And of course, you know, just because we're on one particular path uh, doesn't mean that we can't vary off of that path to explore things along the, along the way. Um, so, but so then that's the structure, that's the approach here. But I didn't want this meeting, this recording, to limit itself to that. So. Um, is there anything in particular that you might want to discuss right now? Yes. So I very, yeah, very, uh, thank you. Thank you. So just to give you a little bit of background. So I did, I had a mentor, we had a relationship for a year and he was actually the one that pointed me to you. He said, are you following Guy on LinkedIn? I said, no, not yet. He said, just, he gave me your name and I started following you because he's a big fan. So what happened? He was in Toronto. We had our meetings virtual, but he had to move back to Australia. He he migrated from Australia to come to Canada, spent here 10 years here, and now he's back in Australia. So obviously with the time zone difference and all that. So we, we ended after a year, right? And I was just messaging him. So I said, you'll never believe who my a new mentor is and I just said you know I I when I saw your name and retired I said what what am I going to lose you know the, the only thing he could say is no right so I said ask they say you have to ask and you know and, and then not to ask and and wonder like what if he said yes so I said let me just send him a quick email so anyway so before we go into I, I know you've described it very well on the structure but I think my initial question to you uh guy is even before that, okay, even before we go into the structures of L and D, so um, how do how do I educate an enterprise on what L and D really is and what it can do, right? Because I feel like I'll give you. I have. A, I'm. I'm a senior manager, and I have a coordinator. That's the L and D team. Mm -hmm. Two people in an organization the size of 2,300 employees across Canada. So I, I don't believe that the enterprise has a maturity in understanding what l and is, what it can do, you know, and uh, as a business partner and how it can help. I think it looks at l and more like LMS administration, you know, to make sure that compliance training is tracked and you know, and, and that stuff. So that's where I am at the moment. So I think, I mean, all of the wonderful stuff that l &D can do to help an organization if the organization understands what it can offer in terms of partnering with the business and understanding the business challenges, the performance challenges, et cetera. 
but we're far from there yet. I think <laughs> I'm just breaking and I'm just trying to find a way to break through. That's where I am right now. Yeah, so this is kind of an age-old problem. And, and the solution, the answer is, well, as always, it depends. So um, it depends on where your uh, enterprise is in the journey from immaturity to maturity. And part of the struggle that I've seen, and it, this was talked about in 1979 and 1980 when I started going to uh, chapter meetings of a professional affinity group and then went to their uh, national and international conferences. So this this seems to, uh, to be part of the baggage that we carry. But uh, the late Bob Mager put this really well, I think, when he, when he asked, uh, he was a keynote speaker at one of these conferences in the mid-80s, and he asked, you know, why are we still arguing about the difference between training and education? And I'll get to how he uh, went further with that. But I think that all of our clients have been in the education system. And uh, probably few of them, some of them, have been through good training. But there's a world of difference between education and training. And in education, we don't know, you know, necessarily when we're presented with educational content or we're delivering educational content, we're talking about topics and knowledge and skills, but they're kind of not in context. Training ad addresses all of that in context. It says you're going to put this widget on that what you call it, and you know that's your job. So it's targeted to specific tasks that produce specific outputs. In education, we don't know. We may train you on how to set up a spreadsheet, but we don't know what you're going to do with that at work. So we can only take you so far. And most clients, I think, most stakeholders don't expect too much from L&D. Now, we've changed the name back in the 1990s from training and development to learning and development. And the question back then was, you know, what's the difference between training and development? Well, some people said training was for your current job and development was for your next job. But but not everybody subscribed to that uh, uh, definition, those definitions. And but we struggle with that. But Bob Mager really hit it on the the nail on the head, I think, back in the mid 80s at an NSBI conference when he said, You're, we're still arguing about the difference between education and training, and you already know the difference. And he said, there must have been, you know, a thousand people in the room. And he said something along the lines of, imagine your daughter goes off to college and she writes home. Yeah, right. That's what we did back in the eighties. We wrote home, and uh, and they tell and the your daughter tells you that she's taking a sex education course. Well, okay. Or she writes home and tells you she's taking a sex training course. Well, the room erupted because he's and he said, "See, you already know the difference between education and training." Um, and and so when we're dealing with clients, we have to figure out, you know, so where are they? What are they thinking about this thing called learning and learning and development and learning development products and processes, et cetera? Um, and so we've got to begin there, where they're at. And, you know, in any enterprise, there's a multitude of people with a multitude of viewpoints as to what is L&D and what's it supposed to do and how's it supposed to do it. And so some, but I think many people are starting with, they see it as an educational endeavor. So we, you know, we gather, we curate content or we buy content or we build content and we give it to people. And then unfortunately, if it's more educational than training, it's missing, you know, how to apply that in your job. No kidding, not your job, not your the people sitting next to you, but your job. And so that's what's often missing. And so we have to find some way to. Uh, introduce this concept of training versus education to our clients and stakeholders. And if they would can see the value of training, because education and, you know, when we do education and we give you knowledge and skills and all of that, um, then the learner has to go back out into the job and figure out on their own through trial and error or social learning how to apply that. 
And it may, you know, so it, it's just going to take longer. And there may be, you know, if it's high risk and high reward performance, well, that's problematic because, you know, they can drive uh, their work into the ditch, their customers uh, into the ditch. The, they can drive the enterprise into the ditch. And so um, what what our value proposition can be is that we can go beyond just knowledge and skills and address how to apply it in people's work processes or, or work streams, as the quality movement used to call it, or work processes, which is the newfangled term for all of that. And so they need to see that, oh, we can address that too. It's basically taking educational content and adding some things to it to make it training because it's the same kind of thing. Here's spreadsheets. Now here's what you do in your job. And maybe you have four or five different things to do. And maybe we only need to cover three of them because once you know the three, you'll be able to figure out the other two informally. And so, but that, but that's the value add that we can bring to our clients. And it's not to say that education is wrong and that we shouldn't provide it, but if it's education can ultimately be effective it's just not efficient. And training can be more efficient, can get you to the end point where, where Guy the learner is performance competence, uh, better, faster, and cheaper than if we had just given him some educational content and then let him go figure it out on his own and you know who knows what would happen. If it's low stakes performance, you know maybe that's just fine. If it's mid stakes performance, well, that's a different decision. If it's high stakes performance, high risks and high rewards, well, Maybe we should do that training thing. So we shouldn't be pushing training over education uh, at every opportunity. We have to uh, help our clients uh, articulate to us and to themselves what's at stake. Is this a big deal, a medium deal, a little de deal? You know, so you know, what are the risks and rewards at stake? And who are the target audiences with that? Is it just Guy and his job and his job title? Or are there other job titles that can also be part of success or failure? And maybe they need to be included in the target audience. Maybe it's a collaborative process where people are doing things together and it's really hard to define that, well, this job title does only this and this other job title does only that. And then this third job title, you know, they have a role to play, but it's, you know, all unique and different between them, but they still collaborate. Or it could be messier where it's more blended, where, you know, sometimes I do this and sometimes you do it, but, you know, it gets done. Somebody does it. And so we need to be able to look at the performance context and the performance expectations and requirements and then address those and help people, you know, my, my uh, language is performance competence, could have been capabilities, could have been capacity, but performance competence, and which is the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs that meets stakeholder requirements. You know, you have a customer, you know, you do stuff, you give it to them, it's theirs, they do, do something with it. And they're the downstream customer and they have requirements for what you produced and handed off to them. You could be writing a script and that gets handed off to somebody who's gonna do a storyboard and that gets handed off to somebody who's gonna shoot the video. You know, so we, we need to understand what's that process, where are the handoffs, who's all involved and who are the stakeholders? There's a customer, the downstream customer, but there might be regulatory agencies. There may be legal aspects and the law department is, you know, are inside our organization. They are representatives of some of the stakeholders and they're trying to keep the organization, the enterprise from, from you know, uh, violating the requirements or exceeding the constraints of those stakeholders. So we need to look at, you know, all the stakeholders, what do they require about the output that we produce? What do they require about the process and the tasks? You know, what do they require about the inputs coming in? You know, you can't take bad materials and make something that's going to fail in six months, but it looks fine on, you know, day one when you're done and hand it off. So, so when we're dealing with our customers and stakeholders, we have to help them see that we can address performance rather than topics, rather than than knowledge and skill items, rather, you know, there's a big thing on skills right now and everybody's chasing skills 
in isolation. And that's fine. It's educational. And if that's, you know, and then if guy learns it, you know, learns that skill and it takes him a while to learn how to apply it well, and he makes errors and has rework and, you know, failures and all of that, you know, if it's no big deal, if it's low stakes, that's okay. But if it's big deal, high stakes, then maybe that's not okay. So we can help our clients. They can make the assessment as to whether it's a big deal or not. And if it's a big deal, we can tell them, hey, this is how we would do things a little bit differently. We're going to have to do this thing called analysis or discovery or, you know, depending where you are, you might be in an engineering organization and they call that part of the process customer requirements. That's where we go get the customer's requirements. No kidding. And then we design something that will meet those requirements and then we build it and then we test it out and we do all those things kind of like training folks do, uh, learning folks do. So whatever your world calls that front end piece where we figure out, you know, what's the thing? What's the issue? What should we do? What are we trying to support? Whatever they call that, that's what we need to displace the A in Addy and say, when we're not going to do analysis. We're going to do that thing that just as you call it. So they understand, oh, I kind of know now what you're trying to do. So it's aligning ourselves to our stakeholders it's aligning ourselves to their critical business issues and their needs as they see them. It's us counseling them and not resisting them, but counseling them on, you know, here's your options. I can do this thing and go buy something and put it in the LMS and everybody's ready to go. But, you know, it might take Guy the Learner, you know, six months to master that. If we buy that thing, we can put some uh, extra effort and energy into it, augment it, and the guy will be quicker to be coming to performance competence. And so maybe that's what you want. And it's it's their call. It's a business decision to spend more money on these things, more time and effort on these things. It's not L&D's decision. And too often it's left to L&D. And I think that's a huge mistake. It's like, okay, um, it's a trap, you know, and we don't want to, you know, fall into that trap. So when we align with our customers and when we get a chance to talk with them, ask them questions about their needs, giving them their options, they begin to see, oh, there's a difference between education and training. And maybe this time I think that, yeah, just do the educational thing. Or no, this time maybe we need to do that training thing with that to make sure that we, we include how to apply what they've learned to their jobs. And maybe we, we're going to buy something, but the target audience is 12 different job titles and they got 12 different applications of this thing. And yeah, that means, you know, in a modular sense, we're going to use that one piece of education and then we're going to create 12 different modules to draw, address the 12 different applications uh, that people need. And it's a business decision to do that. And I think that when we when we engage our customers and our stakeholders and in, in help inform them so that they make a better business decision because they live with the consequences of our stuff being good and, 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 and effective and efficient and meeting their needs. So if you said, oh, you know, it's what? It's going to take me, you know, six to 12 months for a guy to figure out how to apply that thing. And he's going to, he's going to have errors and he's going to, you know, oh. I've got uh, as a, as a, as the business stakeholder, I've got to decide, you know, what do I want? Because you might tell me, okay, if you want that training thing, here's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to do some analysis. We're going to have to do design. We're going to have to have people looking at what we're planning on doing and what we've done and look at the data that we've generated and make sure that it's accurate, complete, and appropriate before we go on to the next step. So we can do the analysis thing. We can do the design thing. We can do the development. And then we can pilot test it and make sure it works because if it's high stakes, we should do that before we put everybody through it. And then when we're all satisfied, when the client and stakeholders are satisfied that what we've done is sufficient, well, then we'll release it. And we'll either push it or we'll put it out in the LMS and invite people to pull it out and use it when they need it or what you know whatever makes business sense, which again, are client decisions. You know, L&D can help the client um, figure out what's their options in all of this. Um, but we should, uh, leave the decisions to them. 
And sometimes clients don't want to make decisions. And so what I would always do is I say, hey, if you don't stop me, this is what I'm going to go do. And here's why. And they go, oh, wait a minute. What? Explain that. And I, then I get a chance to explain that. And they go, oh, I like option B better than your option A guy. And so, oh, good. OK, so I would do that. And if they if they tell me to do something that I really disagreed with, and I'm, I would be so bold as to say, well, you know, let me salute you. I was in the United States Navy. And so, yeah, I know how to salute and follow orders. I'm going to salute you and follow your order. I'm going to do exactly what you said. I wouldn't do it if it was me, but you get to make the decision. So here I'll salute you and go do that. And I'll say, what? What? You know, why is it that you wouldn't do that? You know, I still want it done the way I wanted it, but, you know, tell me why you wouldn't want to do it. And then we can have a dialogue and I can say, well, from my vantage point, which isn't perfect, Here's what I see what's right or wrong about the way you want me to go forward and doing it. But it is your decision. You live with the consequences. Yeah, learning and development will get beat up for producing things that aren't effective. You know, that's just where we are, where we sit in the in the chain of things. Um, but it is your decision because you live with the consequences too. I'll get beat up. You'll have your numbers will go bad or not get good or whatever the issue is that's driving the request. And so that's that's the stakeholder's decision, the client's decision. And so it's just that partnership and collaboration and cooperation. Now, where do you start? Well, you find somebody who's willing to do something with you that's different than the way you're always doing it. And then you can help market that by having them share with their peers what we did and, and how it's different and how this was better. And because you can't, you know, eat the elephant all at once. You got to do it one bite at a time. So as you approach the stakeholders in your enterprise, you need to find a champion who's willing to do, do this differently and then market it, you know, get their permission to use them as testimonials for what you've done. And hey, yeah, call Sally. She knows she was there. She was our client. Um, and because stakeholders probably don't trust us folks in learning and development as much as they trust some of their peers. They may not like their peer, but they trust them in terms of having a business mindset, more of a business mindset than L&D folks have typically had in the past. Um, I think you've you've answered my question very well there, uh, Guy, very comprehensive. And it goes back to the, you know, the classic order taking, like L&D as you know, order takers. So they come to you and say, we need three days of training here. We need half day of training here and all that. So they come to you, fait accompli, you know, this is what they need. Yeah. And so when you kind of like try to explain and give them other alternatives or maybe say, this may not be the best option for what you're trying to achieve at the moment, but you know, they, this is operations. This is what we need. You know, this is, yeah. and you're, you're kind of like an outsider looking in, right? Like, and then they say, what's, and then there's the LND credibility. They're like, what do they know about our operations? You know, they're, <laughs> they're but, in the main office. But they've been in, they've been in the yeah. education system. They all went through it. So they think they know the teacher waltzes in, delivers a lecture, hands out a test, boom, boom, boom it's done isn't that what you guys do and they may have seen something different so they may have but they may it may be still a mystery as to what did it take to do that because they're too busy with their thing to pay attention to your thing and you know what you did and how you did it and what the challenges are and all of that so but but i'd like this i'd like to take a few minutes then to talk about this notion of being an order taker so there's it, this notion of, you know, don't be an order taker. Has it, That was a big deal back in 1979 and 80 when I entered the field. And I was at one of these conferences. It was an NSBI conference. And the, the late Joe Harless was speaking. And, and he articulated something um, in a way uh, that resonated with me because of what i have been taught by the people who were guiding my development in, the, in this field. And he even wrote an article about it. It was in the 1985 uh, Performance and Improvement Journal. And he said, uh, you know, I forget exactly how he got into it, but he said, you know, when your client comes and asks you uh, to develop some training for them, and even if they're specific about what they want, um, he says, um, we we don't shouldn't challenge them and he and he said it this way he said and don't say in your whiniest voice 
are you sure it's a training problem? Because that's what he was hearing. That's what I was hearing. That's what others were hearing from other thought leaders or wannabe thought leaders about don't be an order taker. And his approach to this was do be an order taker and say, sure, I can help you. And I can help you even more if we can do this front end analysis, FEA. That was his label for his approach to doing analysis and avoiding paralysis. But but so but it was critical. And he would explain, you know, why the front end analysis approach was uh, important, because otherwise you wouldn't know what to include and what not to include. It'd be a bunch of topics and it wouldn't be necessarily easy, direct instruction on here's this content and here's how you apply it here, here and here and here. You know, and that just makes it easier for the learner and makes it quicker for the learner to learn something and master something that they can go back on the job then and apply. Because we did our analysis about what's that performance that we might expect Guy and the other learners to have learned a little bit about, a lot about, mastered it, kind of mastered it, got them some point to where they've got enough competence and confidence to go back to the job and try it. So this notion that, you know, we should challenge a request, you know, well, we don't have any data in order to challenge a request. We just have our suspicions. So the way I've tried to, uh, the way I phrase this is, if the request is for new hires, training for new hires, well then, yeah, duh, of course, yeah, you do it because you know, that's obvious. But if the training is to address a performance problem, so so the so if the request is for new hires, that's to be expected. If the request is for solving a performance problem, that's to be suspected. But we shouldn't push back. We shouldn't challenge. In my view, we should clarify that request, understand who, what, why, where, when, and how, et cetera. And, and who are the other stakeholders? Because there may be more than just the requestor. In fact, the requester is sometimes a middleman. They've been told to go get this training, go to the training organization, the learning organization, and get them to do this. Okay, but they don't know much about it. They just know, you know what the request is, and they pass that on. So we've got to figure out who are we talking to? Who's doing this request? Do they know enough about this to help us figure out what our response should be? And so I think we should take the order. We should clarify the order. We should figure out and, and gather the data that's needed in order to develop a project plan so that we can try to meet with the stakeholders in one group or go to them one at a time, however we got to do it, because that varies, and say, well, here's how we would approach the response. Um, and, and then when they see that, the logic in that, what we're going to produce, when, and what does that lead to? How, what, you know, Why do we do analysis? Because it leads to design. Why do we do design? So, it lead, so we can smooth this out and, let, uh, and reduce the rework cycles when we're playing a guessing game because the client said, bring me a rock. And so you bring them a rock, they go, wrong rock. Well, you don't know what color rock they wanted, what size they wanted. You know, you don't know anything. You just, they just that's just the wrong rock, and so you got to go, go get them another rock. And you can waste a lot of time and energy chasing down rocks that that haven't been specified well enough. So that's part of our deal is to not challenge, but to clarify, to test our understanding. Let me test my understanding. So you want it to do this and do that and do that, and let me summarize. Okay, so the whole deal is this. Do that quickly, but but communicate two ways with the requester and the client and the stakeholders so that you are assured that you are on the same page as they are and that they are on the same page as you. And that's when I like to pull out sneaky trick, you know, 27 and say, okay, so I'm going to need source sources for, you know, I'm going to need people to interview or or performance to observe, you know, where is it this happening well so that I can try to get everybody to do it like they do um, or documents to review, et cetera. And I would want my uh, client and stakeholders to handpick my sources so that I don't go look at sources that don't have any credibility, you know, because what we do, we got to produce data 
you know, our analysis produces data, our design produces data, our development produces data. Is that data accurate, complete, and appropriate? Is it based on data that was uh, uh, valid and credible? Because I've had valid data that came from sources that weren't credible and my client rejected it without looking at it because of who I got it from. You know, I put, used to put the names of people on my analysis reports and say, these were the people that I met with to do the analysis. Thank you very much. Your name goes right on the cover page. And my client threw a binder across the room uh, in, a, in a meeting with 30 other people because of those names. He didn't like those names. Those weren't credible to him. Those were the people that I called the friends of training. They were always available to help the people in training and their organizations were happy to get them out of the way, helping training do its thing here and get out of our way. Um, and so I learned a valuable lesson that, that day that, that my, my analysis report was thrown across the room um, and that I needed to put the responsibility for the identifying the sources and making them available to me to, on my client. Um, and, you know, that was, again, you know, I'm, Im, I'm empowering them uh, to empower me. Guy, go meet with these people here, these three people. Okay, are you going to, you know, am I going to call them up and say that you said so? Or are you going to send them an email or uh, you're going to call them up and say, meet with Guy, no kidding, on this date here, we're in a hurry. Because we got something important that we're working on. And so, you know, drop what you're doing or set it aside and make time for Guy. Now, it's, it, it's up to Guy to make sure he doesn't waste people's time, that the things that he asks about aren't silly or, you know, reaching for, you know, because I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I, I have to have, I have to know what I'm doing in order to ask targeted questions to get targeted data back. And then I can go review that with my clients and say, this is what those people said. I, I did these observations. I did these interviews. I read these documents. I put it all together here. And now you guys need to look at this to make sure this is good, either because either it's good stuff in, good stuff out, or it's garbage in, garbage out. You've heard that before. So I've got this analysis data. I'm going to go do a design that I'm going to, and I'll have you review the design to make sure it's okay before I go do development because development is expensive. That's where that's where the time and effort and money, you know, is either well spent or poorly spent because of what we did upstream. Um and either that makes business sense to people and they can be in a hurry and they can be willing to take shortcuts. And that's part of our negotiation with them. Oh, you don't want to talk to five people. Let's just talk to two. Um, and then, you know, there's issues with the number of people that we talk to or the number of our sources because of the non-conscious nature of knowledge and automated knowledge. And you and I can tell a novice how to do something. And what the research shows is that we'll be able to tell them 30% of what they need because 70% of it we've automated. Uh, we've automated it. You know, I don't even, you know, I can do it, but I can't explain it. And, and the good news is that your 30% is different than my 30%. So if you talk to enough people here, you get closer to hundred um, percent. But so what's at risk? Are we going to blow up the world? You know, okay, so then let's just talk to more people. If we're going to, you know, no, if, if it all goes to pieces, if it all goes to Hades, no big deal. You know, it's inconvenient. And we wish it wouldn't happen, but, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Okay, then we can, we're less concerned about getting things to be perfect towards Six Sigma levels of perfection. Um, and, and so that's, that's, again, part of this, dealing with the client and they may come to you and they may have said, yeah, I want two days of this and 20 pages on that, or, you know, a 15 minute video or whatever. Fine. It's a starting point. Um, so I've written a book and it came out uh, last year and it's called the L and D pivot point. And it's at the end of the analysis phase when I'm reviewing my analysis data that I've reached the pivot point. And because the analysis data should show my client and inform their business decision as to whether we should continue with L&D or whether the data suggests it's not knowledge and skills, it's not a deficit of knowledge and skills, it's the process is broken and the tools are broken and the data is no good. And we're expecting people to make silk purses out of sow's ears. Oh, well, you know, okay. I've had clients before say, uh, guy, could you excuse yourself? and go to the cafeteria and get yourself a cup of coffee because we need to discuss this. 
And I said to them, yes, I was expecting you to ask me to do that because the data says we shouldn't continue with learning and development. Well, consultants don't say that very often to their clients. You know, bad for the revenue stream. But but that builds trust with the client. And so my my data showed my client that here's the ideal performance, what you want. Here's the current state gaps. And here's what's the cause of those gaps. And as you can see by the data, training and development isn't going to solve it because it's not due to knowledge and skill deficits in your current population. And they said, oh, well, okay, so we're going to need to put this project on hold, famous last words, and and we're going to go fix those things that your data has pointed out. And because, you know, the data didn't come from me, it came from the people they pointed me to. There's an old joke about consultants. What does a consultant do? They borrow your watch to tell you what time it is. And I would joke with my, my customers and stakeholders and say, that's what I'm doing. I'm borrowing your watches and we're going to synchronize them, and I'm going to tell you what time it is. But but it's not from, you know, I have a method to pull that all together. Your people, you, you and your people have the data that's needed. I own the process, you own the data, that's the deal. And so I'll go get that most efficiently, and you can look at it and decide, so what do we do? So when we get to the pivot point, they may decide to continue with the learning and development effort or pivot to some non-instructional effort, which is what we used to call it back in the day. Or we need to do both because maybe, and this is what happened in that client situation, they said, we're gonna go, we're gonna put this project on hold. No kidding, guy. I know that sounds like it's a you know empty promise, but yeah, we're gonna do that. We're gonna fix these things. Then we're gonna want you to come in and update your analysis data. And then we need you to build the training because. We got a whole bunch of new people coming in. We were going to triple the size of that operation here. We got all these people going to come in. The plans are, we're already recruiting people. So we're in a hurry. We got to fix these non-instructional issues right away. And then you need to build that training in a big hurry. And then we'll train the people so that, you know, we're training the new hires, but we're also addressing a performance problem. And so that was kind of a blended thing. And, and so we've, you know, we've got to be able to do that. Now, you're two people. You have a coordinator and yourself. So some of the things I think that you need to do is either know how to do this stuff yourself or bring in people who can help you do it. But that may be a constraint. You may be expected to do this stuff yourself. So you would need to learn how to do the intake process of a request to formulate a project plan. You know, you have a template and you edit it. You know, it's not creating it from scratch every time. Um, and and then conducting analysis quickly, avoiding analysis paralysis or calling it discovery or calling it customer requirements or calling it whatever makes sense in your context. It, doing that analysis, design, and development quickly, um, working with uh, what what we too often call subject matter experts. I've always wanted to, and I do call them master performers or top performers or star performers or something, because subject matter experts. It all sounds like it's very subject matter expert oriented, subject matter oriented. And I wanted it to be performance oriented. And my clients would go, that's different. What do you mean by a master performer? Well, the best of the best. You know, who do you got that's already doing this and you want everybody to be just like them? Well, that's who we want to have engaged in this thing so that they can we can try to extract from them that 30% of what they know that people need to do. And then we need to figure out what's the missing 70%. So we give the learners something that's more uh, total never be completely complete you know perfect but but we need to get them going on down the right path and so that's the deal and so uh how we do that um i can engage other people in the client organizations i can get them to help me on a project because the stakeholders for my project who live with the consequences of whether we do good work or bad work you know it's to their benefit to give me their people to help me help them and so that's again when you're when you're a small operation, you can't do it all by yourself. You can go buy stuff and put it in the LMS, and you know if that's what they want, and they're they're tolerant of the fact that well, it's going to take a while for them pe your people to figure out how to apply this, and then everybody's going to be applying it differently. So you're going to introduce more variation mm -hmm. in your work when you probably want to reduce variation in your work 
and and settle on some standard approach that's been proven to be effective and efficient. Excellent, excellent. Thanks very much, Guy. I know we're uh, seven minutes uh, to our time, and I know that you're going to give me an assignment <laughs> and a reading assignment. I saw your book, the L and D Pivot Point on Amazon, and I, I will, you know, I, I will, I will consider getting that book. I have a, you know, I love to read and learn and all that. So maybe just a quick question for you, Guy. Sure. If you if you can go back in time to when you were just starting out in L&D and all of the experience you've built all these years, if you can change one thing, what would that be? Ooh, I'd be afraid to change, quite frankly, anything because I think that I've been really lucky. I think I've got a unique N of one. On day one, I was introduced to a performance orientation to training that we weren't going to do education. We were going to do training that uh, I was given a, a three things on day one. I was given a newsletter from 19, this was 1979. I was given a newsletter from 1970 that talked about guidance, the short way home. Now, guidance was the language that Rumler and Gilbert used. But by 1979, nine years later, it was called job aids. Well, then later on, it became electronic performance support systems or quick reference guides or informal SOPs or just performance support. So it's resources that guide performance. And, and so I read that newsletter the, the first afternoon at my new, in my new job right out of college. And they'd also given me this book written by uh, the late Bob Mager, Robert F. Mager, and Peter Pipe on analyzing performance problems. This is a classic. It was written back in 1970 as well. And, and I read that at the hotel room because, you know, my wife and my stuff hadn't arrived to the new city yet. And and so I read that that night, and it was eye-opening about the difference between, you know, when you're trying to do instruction that's performance-oriented, performance-based, uh, you got to look at the situation to see, is performance got anything to do with this? Or is this really something else? Like the process is broken and the tools are bad and the data is bad. And so all the instruction, the training, the learning in the world is not going to fix that. And I was also given uh, this book from the year before 1978, uh, Tom Gilbert's book, Human Competence, which is a really tough read. Uh, it was for me. And and so I started on that book that week. And then later on, I was given a bunch of workshop materials. And so I got oriented from day one into this performance thing. And I was taken to conferences and I joined a, a local chapter in Detroit um, that was all about this. And I heard from speakers, I talked to other people that were all into this already. And so my starting point on this probably could have been more perfect, but it's hard to imagine how it could have been. And so I think I was just very lucky. So I always suggest to people, you know, this, the first book that I would give somebody new to this business is Analyzing Performance Problems by Mager and Pipe. That classic book, it's got a nice flow chart in it, which wasn't the first of those kinds of flow chart because Rumler and Gilbert had one too that was dated earlier. And Zap the Gap by the Robinsons, uh, Jim and Dana Robinson, uh, their Zap the Gap uh, a book and, and workshops and all that had a similar kind of flow chart. Well, these flowcharts are really just to help us figure out in analysis whether or not learning content is going to make a difference or it's just going to be an expense. It's not going to have an it's going to have a negative or nil ROI because we're going to spend money and we're not going to get anything for it. We're just going to have wasted time and all that stuff. And that's a cost to it. And so so how do we avoid that? How do we help guide our clients, which is what the L and D pivot point is all about and my other books too because the reading assignment i was going to give you is to uh scan and read sections of or read it end to end my 1999 book lean isd but if you were to get the l d pivot point book that covers um part of what lean isd covers and it's a later version is you know 20 years later and and so the L&D pivot point talks about the instructional design or instructional development process, the addy like level of instructional design. But early in my career, when I was back at Motorola before I became a consultant, but back in 82, as a consultant, 
I became known for doing what was called curriculum architecture design, performance-based curriculum architecture design, where we would identify all of the content, uh, instructional content that included job aids and training courses, nowadays known as performance support and learning experiences, same things, um, with the performance orientation, because we wanted it to not be educational. We wanted it to be training. We wanted the, the job aid to tell you how to do the job <laughs> or for the learning experience, how to do the job, both do that. So part of what is new and a little bit different is that, uh, in terms of how I now articulate that is that when we're doing analysis, we need to look at the situation and figure out, does guy, the performer, need to have memorized that stuff so that he has it on demand because there ain't no time to look it up. So a learning experience should prepare a guy through practice with feedback and practice with the feedback and practice with feedback so that when he comes time to do it, he's got it in his head and he can do it. And, and maybe we don't know how often he's going to be doing it. So we had to give him space learning to keep that evergreen fresh in his head uh, so that he can do it. Um, or... Does the performance context allow for a referenced performance response? You can look it up and it's okay. The customer, whoever you're dealing with is fine with the fact that you took a moment to look something up and then did the work. So every, you know, in my experience, I'm, I'm just a wild ass guess here that, you know, 80% of the time, uh, the performance context does not demand a memorized performance response. Now you might think, well, okay, so if you're an airline pilot, you know, that's not true. You got to know what you're doing while you're doing it. But they've got those SOPs up there in the in the cabin. And, you know, the co-pilot is looking at those and reading those and helping the pilot, you know, because we can't, we didn't, we can't rely on memories which are faulty when we have such high stakes flying hundreds of people around here. That's high stakes performance. And so we try to get you to memorize it, but we don't trust the fact that you can actually recall everything. And so we have augmented your memory with this stuff in a job aid or a, a SOP, um, standard operating procedure, or whatever whatever you call it. You know, don't call your thing a job aid if everybody's calling it, you know, performance support. Don't call it performance support if everybody's calling it job aid. You know, adapt to your situation and what the language of your customers, you know, use that. Make your stuff fit in their world. They don't want to learn your stuff and your lingo and how it's this almost the same or exactly the same, but you call it something different. They don't have time for that. But but so your reading assignment is to look at at, at the um oh the mid-level view. So I I just made a mistake here. That was the micro level. So the mid-level view is a book that I wrote in 2001 and it's called Training and Development Systems View. It's both uh, an articulation of the various processes in an L&D function with an, a, a, a very high-level, quick assessment tool at the very front end. Then you can read all about the processes, and then there's a detailed assessment uh, at the very end of the book. So my goal would be for you to look at that, see how the ADDIE kind of process fits within all the other processes. And there's the curriculum architecture processes in there too. It's like systems engineering and then bench engineering where we have a system and then you build one part and somebody else builds another part and we bring it all together. So, so that's the first reading assignment is about the L&D function or the training and development function, as I called it then. I've updated the book more recently, just a couple of years ago, but the 2001 version is free. So depending on, you know, if you want it, want the uh, free version, you can go get that as a PDF and read it. And uh, um, or you can buy the newer version of that book. Um, but that's not, you know, absolutely necessary. They're, they're, they're similar. There's some old language in the 2001 version. And I've updated some of that and tried to make it more current. Um, can you give me the title again, uh, uh, Guy? Yeah, T ampersand D okay. systems view. Okay. And I will send you a link to where that you can find that in my, I've got several websites and okay. I've been creating an archive website as I go into retirement. Here's all the stuff. It's all over the place in a couple of other sites, but here it's distilled and better organized uh, 
for people to to search and find whatever they they uh, that might meet their needs. And I'll get the LND pivot point. I would like that to have like as my reference. Sure. And that LND pivot point would be more appropriate for when we get into the micro level. Okay. So, you know, you don't have to read that one right away, but you can read it in whatever order, or however you want to do that here. What I will do is I will send you the assigned readings for the three parts. Okay. And you can do the first part and then you can let me know when you'd like to get together again and we'll have another session like this where we'll answer, you know, we'll you'll ask me your questions and I'll try to answer all those. And then I'll set up, you know, the next uh, segment, if you will, of our uh, little journey together. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. Thanks very much, Guy. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. You're most welcome. Weekend. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Thank you, Guy. Thank you. Bye.